Hi everyone, so I'm Rob Taylor. I'm currently the, the CEO of Chipflow and we're working at Chipflow working very hard on making uh, chip design accessible to everyone eventually, starting with like the embedded systems world that kind of I know and love. Um, so I guess like, what I'd like to talk about is why, why do I care? Why do I care about open source chip design? What, what does it even mean? Um, so I've been doing embedded systems design for quite a long time. Uh, this is uh, maybe about 2000 in a small room in, uh, uh, <laughs> in, in, uh, uh, in West London. Um, and you know, with my companies Collabora and CodeThink, you know, I, we've, I've, I've worked on you know, devices. I was very early on in kind of engaging using open source systems, especially Linux. In building products, and uh, and you know, at my first business collaborator, we were working with Nokia on the 770, 800. This crazy idea of a web tablet that has uh, you know allowed you to it's like a phone but without a keyboard. Really interesting idea. I don't know if it ever took off. Um, and you know, uh, and with those companies, I have delivered. You know, a hell of a lot into the automotive space, networking, uh, even like entertainment technology. Um, and, and I think Ben's here, and I think uh, we even did a brain scanner once, um, an MEG brain scanner. So I've got a lot of experience in helping big multinationals build real stuff and get it shipping to market, whether that's from the start or coming in the end to save something. Um, and... But there's always been one big problem. Almost, almost every project. Those damn chips. Like, they're always hard, right? At the start, you've got, okay, we know what the product is we want to build. Can we find the right chips to build this product? If you're even slightly cutting edge, then it's probably going to be no, and you need to do something quite um, inventive, right? Um, and then you get about halfway through the project, or even worse, towards the end of the project, and you realise, oh, the thing we were going to use on that chip doesn't actually work properly. Um, and <laughs> uh, we're going to have to try and work around that. OK, that's fun. Um, and, then, and then you get out to the market. You know, you actually, your product gets out there, and it's selling really well. And then, what do you mean there's no more chips available? Uh, yeah, we were really planning on using that for the... You said, you said that'd be available for all our product lifetime? What, what, what do you mean somebody else has bought them all? Um, and so, so yeah, this, is, this is really kind of like a pain point that my customers and my teams have felt over and over again. I can see Ben nod, nodding away back there and a few wry smiles in the audience for those of us from the embedded space. Um, and so, okay, you think, well, maybe... <laughs> Maybe we could just like build our own chips for our products, right? Um, but that's been that's really hard. It turns out. Like I talked to a load of people I worked with over the years, and quite a few had said, "Oh yeah, we thought about that," and then we ran away screaming because um, you know it's like you're going to put at least twenty million aside, so it's not a business unit decision; it's a corporate level decision. Um, Finding the people who could actually do chip design and know how to do it successfully, get a chip out to market, well, those are hen's teeth globally, right? If you're one of those people, no, actually, if you're kind of slightly below one of those people, you're going to get a million per year in Silicon Valley right now, right? Salary plus stock options. So, okay, yeah, that's a hard team to hire. It's a hard team to retain. Um, and even the hyperscales have problems, like Meta, still having problems to this day, as far as I can tell in hiring and retaining uh, a semiconductor design team. Uh, Google's done okay, but, you know, and Apple's done pretty well. Anyone else? You're kind of probably going to be struggling. So that's not an option, uh, at least not in the traditional model, right? What's out there, how you build chips today? And this is where kind of this whole open source thing starts to get really interesting because last... Oh, five years or so, we've had this kind of like knee of an exponential curve in projects which allow you to, for designing digital logic, projects for implementing chip designs, testing chips, chip designs, um, 
And that is really, what that's doing is it's bringing down that barrier to access and also bringing down the complexity, which is what open source always does when it comes into a space. I'm not going to talk through the entirety of this, but actually kind of like the history goes back quite a surprisingly long way. Ooh. Hello. I don't think that's me. People at the back, I'm pretty certain that's not my screen going off. It's, it's, it's showing it here, so it's uh, somewhere between that dongle and the projector. A perfect example. I'm sure that I'm sure this is a hardware failure. <laughs> yeah, they'll they definitely they'll uh, they'll be yeah. So you know, some some watchdog decide to fire because like the software hit some sort of hardware bug that froze the system. Um, <laughs> so the history of this goes back quite a long way, um, actually even into the 80s, right? So some of the projects which we're still using in this space today actually go all the way back to like the early 80s, right? Like uh, the concurrent with like the first open source projects, um, things like Magic VLSI especially, um, and uh, the Coriolis project, which is a project to, for how you make the designs for chips. Um, but like I say, so we start to get into the last, you know, five, six, seven years, and we start to get this acceleration going on. Uh, the Risk Five Foundation comes along. Um, really, again, that's promoting an open standard for how you make a processor. Um, we get some corporates coming along. So Google uses uses open source to build the security core that's used in both the servers and in the pixels. Uh, pixel range of products. Um, really interestingly, we get this open road. So DARPA starts funding projects to be able to have open source tools to make to fully make chips end to end, right? And this this is the open road project. Um, and yeah, we start getting more and more corporate involvement. Especially China gets very very interested in this, especially as the gates start to shut down on them. And then EU, if you look at the, the Chips Act guidance, big sections on open source, you know, both design components, what they call IP in this space, terribly, but design components and tools. Um, and so what this really comes to is that you can pretty much make a chip from scratch using purely open source technology. A bit limited, like you know, it's uh, when you're not going to be making a three nanometer chip with it anytime soon, but you can. You can build chips for your products. And so, really, and the other thing that's really been really interesting in this space is we've got this clash coming in between like people with a hardware centric view and people with a software centric view, and that's creating a whole new bubbling ecosystem and thought process around how to make hardware. Because if you go and actually do hardware or you know, chip design in the traditional way, it's like the 90s called and they want everything back, right? I mean, it's, you use tickle crying out loud. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, it, 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 it's, it's, all, it's, uh, it's tools that aren't meant to be plumbed together, don't have APIs, so you're plumbing together with Tickle. Um, you have, uh, 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 you know, um, like the licenses are geographically located. So if you've got a license for an open source, for, for an EDA tool, quite likely it says your people using that tool have to be sat such and such distance from this point. Um, and, and, but the really interesting stuff that's happening is where the software world collides with the hardware world, right? So people wanting a cloud-like experience and also using higher level languages than, than the traditional hardware design languages. So the hard, traditional hardware design languages, you know, they've been around for a long time. They're quite an esoteric skill set, right? The number of people who can come out, come out of university 
programming, Verilog, VHDL, which are the two kind of key ones, they're probably in the small hundreds in the UK today, right? Um, so, and you know, they're not, it's not that much, you know, it's in the small thousands worldwide. So, um, what you've got is really interesting projects like Sots with MyGen, now we've got Amaranth, uh, we've had Chisel, and this idea of using software type skill sets and batteries included languages to be able to build a hardware design and get it manufactured. And at Chipflow, we're working very closely with the, the Amaranth project, uh, which comes out of about you know, 10 years of experience of, with, the, with MyGen project and then the NMyGen project. Um, and there is a difference between writing software and writing hardware, right? And the key thing that we're seeing now is like really getting tools which focus on just learning that, dif that difference rather than le learning a completely different way of working. Um, and so this kind of level of transformation that we're seeing come out in the market in, in the open source world much like software has happened with software, right? Open source always causes change in industry. It always causes um, the appearance of new business models. You know, it allows skills to come from new geographies, be more global, and it enables new technologies. So if we think about open source software, we can point to directly to Google and Amazon and Facebook, and the whole class of business that was only enabled because there was Linux, right? Uh, and there was Python. Um, and these, these, those businesses would not have been able to be a successful business model if they built off Microsoft Windows. And so we're gonna see a whole host of new business models come out of this. Um, we're already seeing that sort of experimentation starting to happen. It's still early days. Um, you see people taking the existing model, so Basically, when it comes to chips, it's a product model, right? A uh, fabulous semiconductor vendor goes out, they look over the market, look at the needs in the market, they come up with a product idea, and then they spend three or four years implementing that and then bring it out to market. So that means you know, when, you, when you're doing something cutting edge, you're going to be waiting four years for a chip that'll do it. So maybe that'll change. Maybe we'll have like instantaneous companies being able to go this is what I'm doing today, and be right on the cutting edge. Um, and we're seeing, you know, so as well as that sort of traditional model of, of building a product using open source and getting to market faster, you're seeing platforms, subscription-based models, uh, supply chain aggregation models. Uh, and, yeah, we're going to see, I'm still, one day we'll see the uh, Google equivalent. So, you know, two girls in a garage, do something amazing, and this is what enables them to turn that into a world-changing business. Um, geographies, right? So, like, look at the open source world, like, you know, China, India, um, uh, South America, all massively enabled their economics, economies by having this capability. Now, the, the silicon world is very tight on geographies nowadays, right? Uh, manufacturing, as you'll know from all the news, a lot of that's in Taiwan. Might be an issue in the near future. Um, there's a lot of the tools are in America, and that's an issue for China now. Um, and uh, and the skill sets. I mean, there's not a lot of countries out there or geographies out there actually producing enough skill in this area, right? So open source really starts to democratize that that ability across nations and across, uh, and across collaborations of nations. And that's why it's been uh, identified so much by especially China and the EU. And the other side of this is like bringing new physical technologies in the chips, but in the semiconductor space to market is always really hard because you kind of end up having to build the entire supply chain for yourself. But if you've got an open source ecosystem, you can come in and start to deliver new technologies into the marketplace at a much lower barrier to entry. Um, here I'm thinking of things like photonics, like uh, gallium arsenide, which was big news in the UK at the moment, uh, silicon geranium, 
uh, plastic electronics. So we're working, so Chipflow we're working very closely with Pragmatic Semiconductor. And they've got a factory up in Durham that makes chips out of plastic, right? Uh, almost throw away, uh, throw away levels of price. Um, what's that going to enable? I think there's a whole load. I could talk for another half hour on that. So these are the things that I think are really going to come out of this. And the reason that Chipflow exists is really to both drive and, and ride on this wave, right? It's going to happen. Um, and you know, with this, is, this is an open UK conference. You know, the UK has a difficult relationship with semiconductors and chip designs. Um, I mean, there have been, like, in the last few years, there have been some real heroes um, in, 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 in government in the, in the, um, that have been pushing an agenda around this and trying to get something to come together. Obviously, uh, we don't have the most stable governance situation at the moment. So I, I wonder, it'd be nice to see those things come to fruition. Not sure they will. But to highlight the things that I think are really, really important uh, for the UK and then what the UK can leverage out of that new open source ecosystem. I think one thing is like training is so important. So enabling, you know, I, I, I want to see like high school students designing their own chip using Python, getting that built in a term, right? As one of your term courses. Um, especially, I know, we should, should just be a default for... Um, uh, for, you know, first-year computer science and engineering in universities. And we can get that, right? So we got an Innovate UK grant to build exactly that using the plastic process. Um, but also that way that it can then really enable innovation. And then by innovation, I mean both kind of knowledge transfer from academia into industry, but also kind of real, real physical Real physical innovation, so those new processes. Um, like I say, we've got a bit of a cornerstone in gallium arsenide in this country, but the, you know, enabling that kind of experimentation that I think as a country we're very good at. Like, going, this is a really cool idea. Let's experiment with it without having to build up our entire supply chain. You've got an ecosystem that you can interface with. Um, I think we're going to see this design and kind of our the way that we work with the way that we build services. In this uh, systems in this country, I'm heavily influenced by this, and that you know so this is a tool that the UK can use to really push further the embedded systems capability, electronics capability of this country, and you know it's the UK. So services are really really important. Right, eight percent of our GDP, I think, is services still, despite some people trying to make it not that, um, and. You know, so if we can build those skill sets, this, this is really an enabling capability for us to have sort of services that we export, high quality services to export around the world to really to allow um, you know innovation globally and delivery globally globally of electronics. Um, and that's pretty much the end of my talk. So I'm really looking forward to your questions. Thank you very much. <laughs> Hey Rob, um, so how are you envisioging this working then? Well, or rather, how does it? So, is everyone going to be making like risks, uh, risk processes with their own extensions that are different? So, there's going to be like a massive mixture of extensions that you're somehow. You basically, are we all going to end up running Gentoo because we have to run <laughs> for every single? Yeah, I, think machine. I, I refer you to Buildstream, maybe if I don't know if they're talking about that later, but <laughs> or Yocto, but yeah. Um, so. I think um, I think processes aren't that interesting, right? The really interesting thing is what you build. Uh, so, more important is probably being able to do your analog electronics and hook that up with a digital controller. Um, one of the things that we're looking at with with Pragmatic is, you know, traditionally, like something like that, you'd ship a small processor on, but that actually ends up using quite a lot of space and makes it a bit more prone to manufacturing failures. So how about we just, you know, if you're making a product with plastic electronics, just code exactly what you need it to do. 
don't use the process. And, and I suppose for those sort of things, you're already going to be using Yocto or Builder anyway to minimise your resource use and attack surface, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, with the Chipflow platform, um, you actually get... So as part of doing your design, you also spit out, it also spits out the software build for you to start from. Okay. Or oh, is that me? <laughs> Hello, Rob. Hello, how um, are you doing? So uh, um, I talked a bit last week at, at Cloud Native Security Con about the implications of on the on security for um, of open source silicon, um, you know, particularly in terms of, of things being audited and verifiable. Yeah, right? you absolutely. Know, as as anybody who's uh, who's who's been involved with um, any of the major processor you know, manufacturers, we all know that there's a ton of proprietary things in there that most people just have no idea actually exist. Yeah, exactly. um, what, what are your thoughts on, on the sort of security aspects of this? I mean, obviously, this, there's clearly things like Open Titan, which is, yeah. it has a very specific security focus. But Exactly. And, and I think that's, that these key with securities, it really depends on what you're doing, right? Um, I think you know, having an open, especially if you're working with an open process, right? That gives you then the ability for have many eyes mm -hmm. looking at, say, the physical thing that's being made, the, the files you shipped to build the thing that was being made, the logical design, and looking for Trojans and finding new ways that, you know, spotting things that could be CVEs, right? Um, but also, I think there's kind of the innovation on the processor side. As well, I mean, we've seen some really cool stuff come out from some of the universities. Yeah, uh, I was talking about Cherry and uh, yeah, and, Ch and Cherry is a really great yeah. example. Um, you know, that's a project that's been that was worked on for years at Cambridge, and it was really Risk Five that allowed that to leverage into something that had a real commercial form, yeah. and then that brought ARM onto the table, right? So now you got the ARM um, Morello. Yeah. Uh, so. You know, exactly, this is kind of a good example of the way that open source works as such a good knowledge transfer in, capability. So, the, so that, that's really enabled the, the uh, realisation of the, that instruction set. Exactly, yeah, that, that concept, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. It's taking it from an idea in a lab to something that's going to go be in the market relatively soon. Yeah. In an amazingly short time. I think we had the questions over there. Yeah. I like the T-shirt. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, Marno from uh, Low Risk. Hey. Um, so there's lots of languages to do harder description in, and you have Python versions, you have Scala versions, you have Haskell, anyway. Um, one of the main problems with using it for like a production, production silicon mm -hmm. is that you have all these EDA tools that you need Verilog or VHDL, so most of the time you'll have a compiler from these higher level languages to Verilog. Um, how, how, do you have any idea of how to kind of get around that? Because that so, also brings a host yeah, of problems I mean, with it. Because uh, then you usually have like a Verilog freeze and then you have to start <laughs> making like metal fix and it gets really, yeah. really, really messy very quickly. It, get, it gets So horrible. how do you get around this kind of lock-in in the EDA so, tools? In chip flows, it, how we're doing it in chip flow is being like, no, we're doing it all with open source. We want to be able to go down and work at the deepest plumbing levels and have information flow all through the design process rather than this kind of jumping between point tools and kind of really important information about how you can do a more optimal design, having that lost. Now, that means, you know, that decision means that we're going to be stepping down through the nodes. We're not going to be going doing a 12 nanometer tape out potentially anytime soon, though I know that the open road guys are actually doing 12 nanometer tape outs using open source on, on Intel at the moment. Um, but I know there's, we know that there's, there's, there's lots of gaps, right? But that's a process and that's, you know, that's really a focus of collaboration, especially between the US and EU. Um, so yeah, that's how we're doing it, right? We're just saying like, screw the commercial tools. Like the only one we use is Calibre because we need to, when we send something off to a fab, um, for those that don't know, Calibre is like the gold standard of checking that something is meeting all the rules for the foundry. Your next question. Okay. Oh, ben. So, do you think we'll see sometime soon a like 3D printing style technology for chips for just people who can do it themselves? 
Uh, yes, um, this year. I mean, it won't, it'll be like a two nanometer type thing, but yeah. Other questions? Any other? We got, that was a really short question, so <laughs> have anyone got anything desperately itching on them? No. Oh, go on. Yeah, something. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, you're still mic'd up, I can hear you. Yeah, I, I think I'm still mic'd. Um, so um, you, you talked a little bit about the history, right? You showed that chart you know, going yep. way back in 10 years, 15 years. Um, has the, the complexity of, of what's being built increased as the ability Absolutely. to do it increased? So is that, is that a tension between you know, you're, you're trying to catch up with the tools to, to build it in the open, but at the same time, you know, the complexity of what you're trying to do is increasing, so you're kind of always behind? Or is that... Is that something that's not um, the way that I'm concerned? About? I, th I think I think they kind of feed into each other, right? It's more a virtuous circle than kind of one thing chasing another, right? Um, like you know, so if a, if a university say building out, you know, a, a many core design, um, like Black Parrot from Georgia, I think. Um, you know, they're, they're able to they're able to do the work on the tools to get them to where they want to be, right? So it's more, it's, it stops being that kind of hard delineation that you get when something's commercial between, like, there's people that do this and there's people that do this, right? In open source, we, you know, that becomes a lot more permeable a membrane, much more migration between communities. Do you think there's going to be kind of political tensions in this space in yes. the same way there was around cryptography? Oh, absolutely. Oh, there already are, right? It, right. So you can't export EDA tools uh, to China from the US already mm. today. Um, so, yeah, where this stuff gets built, much, much like in the early days of Debian, right, and we had yeah. the, the separate repository for all yeah, the yeah, yeah. cryptography stuff, we're going to have to worry about. I'm that. old enough to remember that, Rob. Yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> um, so yeah, yeah, that is, geopolitical tensions are going to play into this. Um, I think mostly in a positive way because, in the end of the day, open source is the one model that we know that allows antagonistic players to actually collaborate, right? So I think it plays into it in a positive way overall. That doesn't mean it's going to be a smooth journey. Another question. Last one. Are those um. Those export laws, do you, think, do you think Europe and the UK are going to have an advantage there? And are, are they going to take it, like, are they going to exploit that advantage? Or do you think the Far East are going to build their own and they're going to be the ones that, that build all that tooling? So I kind of missed the start of your question. So the export control laws from the US, yes. do you think, it, like in the new world where everything's open source, do you think the Europe and the UK have an advantage there yes. that they'll exploit? Or do you think the Far East will end up building all their own stuff and they'll end up being the, the flag carriers for that tool chain? No, I think this is actually a really big opportunity for EU and UK. I mean, we have a lot of deep knowledge about chip building across the EU. Obviously, like, you know, the machines that everyone uses when they're doing the latest cutting edge stuff are ASMR from Holland, right? but also like just the experience in our universities, which unfortunately has kind of been dying for a while, right? But you can see universities starting to bring, spin this back up. Um, like, you know, an old colleague of mine from ARM, John Goodenough's now got a, uh, a new professorship at Sheffield, building up EDA and uh, chip architecture capabilities. Manchester, you know, we've got, so we've got lots of interesting stuff starting to come about. Um, and yeah, we, uh, we so one thing, uh, so, uh, one of my team regularly hosts a call in Euro a European call of all the kind of research universities and companies involved in open source, so we can all collaborate and be um, be sharing strategies, or especially around the funding, but also around kind of technology. So yeah, I think it's going to be a really interesting ride in the next ten years around this. So just to follow up quickly, because I know that the US, have, uh, sorry, the UK have been on and off about whether we're following the US with the export control. So. Have you got any lobbying planned? Any what, sorry? Lobbying planned to make sure that we actually... Uh, where the, we I export? am definitely involved in some lobbying. <laughs> um, at, least, at least by one degree of freedom. But yeah, no, let's, let's see. I mean, I don't think... Realistically, I don't think anything much is going to happen for the next couple of years, at least. Um, that we could do with some stuff happening. Um, but uh, yeah, it's an interesting space. Cool. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Great questions. Thank you so much.